if Hamas really does get to a point where it is like threatened with serious like eradication as a resistance force, then Hezbollah would have to get more involved. So it's a waiting game. This war at the south of Lebanon has been going on now for 37 days. It's escalated to the point where now the Israelis are hitting 40 kilometers into Lebanon. The rules of engagement are breaking down. Hezbollah is running out of targets to hit, and you can only go up the escalation ladder notch by notch for so long before it reaches that tipping point and triggers a bigger war. So if the rules of engagement are breaking down, the real question becomes, how much longer will the genocide in Gaza continue? Because the more things escalate against Gaza and against Hamas, the more likely things will escalate from Lebanon, the more likely we get to that trigger point of war between Lebanon and Israel, and the more likely we get to a trigger point of all-out regional war, which absolutely nobody, including the Americans, want. So really, it's just how much longer are the Americans going to allow the Israelis to slaughter children in Gaza? That's the big question. Thank you so much for coming on The Empire Files, Rania. It is an honor to join you, Abby. Um, and also, can I just say that you look fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to keep up with you, my friend. Rania, oh, stop, you've, stop. <laughs> you've been in Lebanon for quite a while. Um, I'm just curious of like how it feels to be there right now next to a maniac state openly committing genocide and declaring that they want to invade your country. It must be pretty crazy on the ground. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, the insane genocide taking place in Gaza has, you know, the victims are there and the atrocities are there, but there has been a war taking place in Lebanon as well, mostly isolated to the border, but it's a fierce war nonetheless. And, you know, I'm in Beirut, um, and I've been in this kind of bubble of safety, and there's a reason there's a bubble of safety. It's because in Lebanon we have something called Hezbollah, and I know we're going to get into that. Uh, that acts as a deterrent and a, really a protector of the country against the kinds of atrocities that you see taking place in Gaza. Nevertheless, it's, I mean, this is like psychological torture for the people here, first and foremost, because they're watching their people be massacred, um, just like everybody in the world is. I mean, it's horrifying. But for it to just be 200 miles away is just, you know, I don't even know how to describe that other than Every morning you wake up knowing that there's a genocide happening so close to you and you feel really helpless because there's nothing you can do about it. And then the people carrying out that genocide, like you said, are just every, all, every day, all the time. And this is before even the latest genocide on Gaza. Like the Israeli leadership is constantly threatening to flatten Lebanon, to take Lebanon back to the Stone Age, to wipe Lebanon off the map. These are comments that, that a lot of leaders have made in, in, in recent weeks but it's also something we're used to hearing here because it's not a normal country. It's a country that's constantly threatening and bombing its neighbors. And just yesterday, I mean, we're recording on Sunday, the Israeli defense minister, Yoav Gallant, who recently came to fame calling Palestinians human animals, uh, threatened to do to Beirut what Israel has done to Gaza. He literally said, the people of Lebanon will pay the price if it escalates anymore with Hezbollah. I mean, he's just like threatening to kill civilians in Lebanon um, and to flatten the country, to do to Lebanon what's happening to Gaza, to carry out another genocide. And that is psychological warfare. It's meant to scare people here. And so, you know, how are people here doing? You know, the first couple of weeks, people were walking around quite nervous because of what might happen in Lebanon, as well as devastated and heartbroken. But now it's weirdly become this kind of normal. It's a new normal in Lebanon where you just understand that every day, any hour, things could deteriorate and hit the fan within 20 minutes. It will happen, if it happens in Lebanon, it'll happen very, very quickly. I mean, it's been a gradual escalation and we're gonna talk about the details around that. But like I said, it's been isolated to the South. The rest of the country has kind of been operating, you know, business as usual, but under the impression that at any time, everything could go to shit. <laughs> um, and that's a weird way for people to live. And they've been living that now for the past five weeks. Uh, yeah. and it's not normal. And one, one thing I'll add is, um, the Western embassies haven't helped because, you know, since this all started every two, three days, you know, you get a new alert from the American embassy in Beirut <laughs> or the, um, 
you know, State Department being like, leave as soon as possible while commercial sites are, flights are still available because the security situation could deteriorate and we can't help you. Get out while you can. Uh, and that also, yeah, that also plays into people's fears here. At this point, 37 days into the genocide, how many babies do you need to see pulled out of rubble? How many children without parents? How many dead bodies do you need to see to be outraged, to have moral, like, shock? I mean, it's just, at this point, you have to be racist because if you are not impacted by 4,000-plus brown children being slaughtered in cold blood who are just purely innocent souls who are being terrorized by Israel with your tax dollars, like, there's something wrong with you. There is something oh. wrong with you. Yeah, and I, I just want to say, like, um, I do love that most people in the world, I think, are horrified, but it's it shocks me to my core that there's right. people who justify this still. Right. And, uh, and the most powerful people in America are justifying it and, like, bending over backwards of who can support the slaughter of children more. I mean, it's like, I know I know that Nikki Haley's seen videos, you know, of babies dying in Gaza. I'm sure she has. I'm sure Joe Biden has. I'm sure Jill Biden has. I'm sure Anthony Blinken has. I'm sure all these State Department robots that do their press conferences have seen these videos because you can't not see them. They're all over social media, everywhere. And it's just... These children are being crushed in their homes. They're losing their limbs. They're losing their parents and their siblings. They're in hospitals surrounded by bombs and snipers. Like, what is this absolute torture and hell? I mean, infants, infants in incubators, Abby. Like, it, infants in incubators are dying at Shifa Hospital due to a lack of oxygen. They've been, I'm sure you saw that haunting image of all these infants, 37 of them, because two of them died. Upon this recording, it might be more after this comes out, but like 37 infants lined up on gurneys out of their incubators because there's no fuel and oxygen for the incubators. So they're just wrapped up in blankets to keep them hopefully warm enough to survive. And probably these heroes, these nurses and doctors who are the ultimate hero of heroes, um, are pumping oxygen manually for these infants so they don't die. And probably the reason they're in incubators in the first place is because their mothers gave birth too soon because they were stressed out because there's a genocide happening around them. I just can't believe there are people. Like, Abby, I tweeted that image out, and there was responses to me saying, but Hamas. Like, I don't care, I don't care wh whose babies you showed me. I don't care if it's the most disgustingly rabid, crazy fascistic settler imaginable in the West Bank or anywhere in Israel. I don't care how awful they were. If I saw an image or knew that an infant in an incubator was being deprived of life and there was a way to stop it, there's no way in hell I could ever justify that, ever, because I'm not a racist psychopath. Right. Rania, that image is will go down in history books. I mean, it really is like the most glaring example of the cognitive dissonance that people can look at. 30, 37 babies laying on the ground covered in like foil or whatever, trying to keep them warm. Like you said, their mothers were probably malnourished. I can't even imagine what women about to give birth, giving birth with cesarean sections with no anesthetics. No anesthesia. The babies in incubators. This was the this was the lie that was during the Gulf War. They're throwing babies out of incubators. It was the most horrifying thing you can possibly throw out there to, to dehumanize a group of people. Well, guess what? They're doing it right now. They're throwing babies out of incubators, literally. Look at the pictures. How could the world look at this and say, not do everything in their power to give Al-Shifa Hospital generators and fuel and care for these infants? There should be rescue squads going in there and grabbing these babies instead of sitting back and going, oh, well, but Hamas shouldn't have built a command center under the hospital, Rania. Too bad. And guess what we have yeah. for proof? Fucking CGI renderings that not Netanyahu puts out 
so-called operatives again with doctored recordings being like, yo, bro, I got ambulances. I got so many ambulances here. Like, I feel like I am watching a horror movie from like the abyss of hell. Like, how is this yeah. happening in modern history? I mean, this is nuts. It's mind-blowingly I mean, it's- nuts. And then you have snipers surrounding the hospital literally looking in their scopes and pulling the fucking trigger of kids in the ICU ward. Yeah. There's a paraplegic that was apparently shot. Like, they're shooting at people moving inside. So, like, medical professionals, staffers were not are not able to get to patients because they can't move around properly because there's snipers shooting at them when they move. Like, these, this is a war on hospitals. It's actually... It's unprecedented. There's, this has never happened before. Why do you, There's yeah, never been you, a sustained military You said military that, and that was campaign. a super good point. You're like, has this ever happened? Like, yes, Israel targets medics. Yes, they've, they target hospitals. They shell whatever the hell they want. But this is, this is unprecedented, right? I mean, and you, I mean, they're telling, but you know, they're, they're, they're telling us why. They actually are telling us why. I mean, the Israelis are saying that they want to empty northern Gaza of civilians. They want to empty northern Gaza of people. They want to depopulate it. They, they're, the Israeli officials are repeatedly saying that and they actually have leaked like uh, plans for doing so, for, for emptying out Northern Gaza, moving people to, the, people to the South. It's a part of a push to get people out of Gaza and into the Sinai so they can literally retake Gaza. And they're saying it, right? That's why they're destroying hospitals. I mean, think about it. It's obviously not because of Hamas. Like anyone who perpetuates this ridiculous notion of a headquarters, a Hamas headquarters, under every hospital, by the way, like not even just Shifa. There's a Hamas headquarters under every single hospital in Gaza. Uh, anyone who perpetuates that is an idiot or is just justifying the unjustifiable. And you know what? Even if there was, let's entertain it for a moment. If there was a Hamas headquarters under a hospital, you don't, you don't bomb the hospital. It's crazy. You don't take out the hospital. That's insane. Um, but why? So why? Why destroy hospitals? I mean, yeah, it's not just genocide. It's not just... Israel's completely insane, both of which, by the way, are very true. But there's also a military side to this. Like, if you want everybody to leave the North, you need to destroy everything in the North. And especially the places where people who didn't leave are sheltering. A lot of people didn't or couldn't leave. There's people actually in the North still in their homes. Not everybody has left Northern Gaza. Um, There are people still in their homes, but in any situation in the world, you assume hospitals are safe. They're supposed to be protected, like sanctified places for like life and you don't bomb it, right? There's rules against that. But obviously the rules don't apply when it comes to the way Israel does war or genocide, I should say. Um, But because these hospitals are just sheltering tens of thousands of people, they're a threat. You need to get rid of those people. You need them to go south. So what do you do? You need to shut down the hospitals. That's what, like why else would you deprive them of fuel and of medicine and of any resources so that they have to shut down. So that they have, but the thing I want to note, by the way, is there are doctors who are refusing to leave their patients mm-hmm. because that's what it means to leave, by the way. There's people who can't leave. There's patients who can't leave. I think there was one hospital where it was reported in the Washington Post that someone, that doctors with do- from Doctors Without Borders all left and they left the babies there. Like they were like, we had to leave this many children there because we couldn't take them with us because they're, in a hospital and they're sick. Mm. Uh, So they're just there and I don't know. I don't know how they're going to survive. There are Palestinian doctors in Gaza who are refusing to leave their patients and they're willing to die. They're willing to stay and die with their patients. And I want to just say that that is, you know, there's armed resistance, Abby, which is like what uh, Al-Qassam and Islamic Jihad and the PFLP militias and all of these various Palestinian factions that are fighting with weapons. There's that kind of resistance. And then there's what the doctors at the hospitals are doing. That's another kind of, and the nurses, that's another kind of resistance and the tech workers. Uh, and that's important because they're not leaving because they're like resisting Israel's attempt to ethnically cleanse them. That is what's happening. They're like resisting genocide. And I really think that like those people need to be held up as like the best people that exist in the entire world. I have never seen anything like it, Rania, when doctors have to join, stop what they're doing, go outside and plea to the world to not bomb their hospitals in response to a hundred Israeli doctors issuing a letter saying bomb the hospitals. It is staggeringly atrocious. The American Medical Association, there was an attempt by, did you see that? There was an attempt by people 
who are part of the AMA, uh, which this shouldn't surprise us, by the way, because the AMA refuses to support single payer health care. It's like an organization that has a board full of like rich white people who just hate everyone. But um, there was an attempt to get like a res- like some sort of like statement from the AMA out to call for a ceasefire in Gaza, given what's happening at the hospital specifically. And the leaders of the AMA refused to even entertain it. They like shut it down. They shut the debate down. They I should mean, all crazy. revoke their medical licenses. If they, if they, mm-hmm. This is about humanity. It's about the Hippocratic Oath. But these people seem to yeah. just throw their oath out the window. And it's either about for-profit white people on the board of the AMA or just Israeli doctors who are genocidal and just don't care about saving lives, even when it comes to babies laying on the ground being thrown out of incubators, Rania. Do you know um, how many people? Do you know how many people in Israel support a ceasefire? Okay, like I saw Assad Abu Khalil tweet this Yeah, out. please said, tell me. According to one poll, according to one poll, it was three percent, and he was like, "I guess we're just supposed to make peace with the three percent of Israelis who support a ceasefire." Bro, like what? Yeah. Okay. That's a so that's a societal issue. I don't know how you fix, but anyway. Well, fighting between Israel and Hezbollah ramped up. Uh, a lot since October 7th. Um, I was looking at just a timeline of all the escalations. It's really crazy. I mean, pretty much every single day there's fighting going on back and forth. A lot of soldiers have died. Um, It's really hard to tell on the Israeli side the losses because of the censorship within the Israeli military, but I'm, you know, I'm sure that the losses are significant enough. Um, And yeah, a lot of Hezbollah soldiers have died We have not seen an escalation like this since the war in Lebanon in 2006. And I mean, it's just crazy what Israel's doing there, too, because all eyes are on Gaza. But at the same time, every time that there is something happening in Palestine, Israel kind of uses a smokescreen to just assault Lebanon. And you kind of see that all the time, like, oh, Israel's bombing Lebanon again. Like, what the hell is going on there? And and they're using this right now, shelling ambulances, shelling hospitals, shelling civilian targets, using white phosphorus munitions and blocking like fire departments from going to put out fires that are caused by these white phosphorus bombs. Complete insanity going on there, Rania. I want you to talk about what is happening on the ground, what has been happening over the last um, six weeks or so, and also just give us like a broader historical context to this border conflict. So since October 8th, for the last... 37, is it, are we 37 days into the genocide? Um, since October 8th, there has been a war in southern Lebanon uh, between Hezbollah and Israel. Um, as soon as Israel began, began its war on Gaza after October 7th, Hezbollah started firing at Israel to alleviate pressure on Hamas and Gaza. Uh, and the thinking there is to redirect part of the Israeli military apparatus to the north because Hezbollah is part of what's called the resistance actions. I would even, I would even say that Hezbollah is sort of like the leader of the resistance axis, at least militarily at this point. And it started out about like five kilometers between each border. They were firing on each other, each side. It was a tit for tat escalation, sort of, another, you know, one notch, one notch, one notch up the escalation ladder, very, very gradual. A couple of weeks in, it went to 10 kilometers. Then a couple of weeks later, it went to 20 kilometers. And then actually just this weekend, Israel fired uh, at an area of Lebanon called Zaharani at a, tr- a truck, an empty pickup truck, uh, and that was 40 kilometers into Lebanon. So that was another escalation. Um, and in that time, Israel has uh, killed journalists intentionally. Uh, that's what Reporters Without Borders dis- uh, determined, that it was it deliberately targeted journalists, and it killed a Reuters correspondent. And on top of that, they recently escalated, actually about a week ago, they fired at a couple cars that were driving. Actually, a lot of, so a lot of people in Beirut they go south during the weekends, or not south, they go to the villages during the weekends, and a lot of people live in the south. Like, I, you know, I have a mountain village. A lot of people from my village work in Beirut or, or live in Beirut, and then they'll go spend the weekend in their village home, right? That's like a pretty common thing that happens here. So they were actually, this family was leaving their house in the south to go back to Beirut, like most people do on Sunday nights. And the Israelis targeted them with a drone and killed a grandmother, and the mother, I think, later died, and three children, three daughters. And the reason I raise all that is just to say there is a war happening in the South. Uh, And before I get to the sort of like background of some of the, you know, the 2006 stuff you asked about, I just want to note, militarily speaking, what this has meant in terms of numbers, why Hezbollah is doing this. Mm -hmm. A third of Israel's military apparatus is present on the Lebanese border because of the war in southern Lebanon. 
That's more than like 80,000 Israeli soldiers. And then another, so if you think about the, how many are engaged in Gaza, it's about 100,000 Israeli soldiers are engaged in the, engaged in the war on Gaza. So 80,000 at the northern border. So again, that's to alleviate pressure from Hamas. Half of the Israeli Navy has been deployed to the Lebanese front, which is apparently more than the capacity deployed to Gaza. A quarter of the Israeli Air Force has been deployed to the Lebanese front, which includes something like 100 different type of aircraft, right? Half of the missile and air defense units deployed to the Lebanese front from Israel. Um, that's depleting, I, you, that's, that's meant to deplete the Iron Dome. About a third of logistical units have been deployed to the Lebanese front. 65,000, this is actually important, 65,000 Israelis have been evacuated from about 43 what we call settlements um, in, the north, in the north of Israel. Uh, and then another 70,000 have evacuated something like 50 settlements in the Gaza envelope, as they call it. Wow. Um, so that's over 100,000 Israelis have left the north and the south of what's considered Israel. That's unprecedented. Um, that's huge. So it's, I, that's all just to say what's happening in Lebanon has already done some damage to Israel and is not only just alleviating pressure on Gaza, but is also taking away resources from the Israeli military. So, right. and again, the war at the border, it's not at the scale of Gaza, obviously, but there's been 80, Hezbollah has lost over 80 soldiers. Uh, which is a lot. Why is it that Israel ha isn't just going all out on Lebanon, right? It's been 37 days. Well, in 2006, Hezbollah fought a war against Israel and Israel had to basically admit defeat after 33 days of doing what it does best, which is killing civilians. Um, Israel killed over a thousand Lebanese civilians in that war and they lost 121 soldiers, which at that time was quite unprecedented. Israel doesn't really ever have to lose soldiers or at least by then it hadn't really ever lost that many, not since like wars in like the 70s. Um, so that was a very big deal. Uh, and that they were fighting against this much weaker militia force, Hezbollah. And that's, you know, Israel occupied, just some more background, Israel, for those who don't know, Israel occupied Southern Lebanon from 1985 during the Lebanese Civil War up until the year 2000. Um, and in that time, it committed atrocity after atrocity. It ran torture facilities. It funded this fascist militia called the South Lebanon Army to carry out lots of his dirty work. I mean, and on and on and on and on. And Hezbollah emerged in the South as a resistance force in the 80s to that Israeli occupation. Does that sound like a similar story, Abby, <laughs> that we've heard before? Um, and in 2000, Hezbollah basically kicked the Israelis out. The Israelis, they forced the Israelis to withdraw. It was a huge victory for Arabs across the region. I mean, for the first time, Arabs liberated land from Israel. Um, and so since 2006, Hezbollah has only gotten stronger. It has gotten bigger. Um, it's got like over 100,000, I believe, uh, soldiers ready to fight and like ready to die for the country. Uh, they're very well trained. They're very well armed at this point. I mean, they were, I think they had like Katusha rockets back in 2006 and they exacted a lot of damage on the Israelis by firing on Israel. Now they have precision guided missiles, um, they have a lot now. They've got a lot. They have barely showcased what they have. They've got drones. They've got years of on the ground experience in Syria, fighting alongside conventional armies like the Russians. Um, so it's a much stronger, much more powerful force. And for that reason, Israel has not dared to mess with Lebanon in terms of going into a full out war since. Um, that said, the longer the genocide in Gaza continues, the more likely a wider war in Lebanon becomes and a wider regional war becomes. And we can go get like, we can get into that in a bit into like why that is and also what Hezbollah's red lines are. But I just really want to emphasize that Hezbollah has acted for the last 37 days. Its existence as a powerful military force has acted as a powerful deterrent to Israel doing to Lebanon what it's done in the past. And that's huge. It's been 37 days and the Lebanese airport is still functioning. Usually whenever there's a problem between Israel and Lebanon, the first thing they do is bomb, bomb the, the airport. airport. Yeah. They, ha they haven't done that this time. And the reason they haven't done it is because, I mean, they still can, it might happen, but they know that when they do, Hezbollah has the capacity to hit their airport. So there's a calculation at play that makes the Israelis think, you know, 15 times before they want to really escalate against Hezbollah. That's what I was thinking, too, when I was looking at this timeline. It seems like there's a lot of reluctance. I just want to make the point yeah, that, like, go. Lebanon at this point, in terms of occupying it, is off limits to Israel. In 2006, 
the Israelis tried so hard to invade Lebanon. They tried so hard. One village after another, a thousand of their troops couldn't make it past a few dozen Hezbollah guys in villages in the south. Like it was such a humiliating defeat. And with Hamas in Gaza, we're talking about people who are operating out of a concentration camp that's under siege, which has now been turned into a death camp. And they're using lots of homemade weaponry. With Hezbollah, it's a much different situation. You're talking about what amounts to an army operating in a country that is not under siege, that has lots of access points to get stuff into the country, and that has weapons coming from outside. So again, a completely different ballgame. So Israel, as much as it would love to occupy so much of Lebanon, it just can't. Right. I mean, yeah, the fact that Hamas is like retrofitting like things that Israel <laughs> uses to try to terrorize them and shoot it back mm-hmm. at them. And then, yeah, just just the complete loss of, a, of an actual ability to have a ground game. The coward, the cowardly nature of Israel to just like assault people from the sky and just kill civilians in mass and just how scared they are to actually go in and fight people. I just want to roll yeah, real yeah. quick. I just, just to build on what you're saying, apparently in Gaza, they've got drones like firing bullets. Like they can't even, <laughs> they can't even f- go and fire bullets themselves. Oh they hide God. in tanks. Oh my they hide God. in tanks and then just like fire bullets from drones. Like it's the most cowardly thing imaginable. It's insane. So let's talk about Hezbollah because you mentioned that it's a completely different um, group and, and it does, it is like well stockpiled. It, it has an official military um, and it does have help from the outside, but of course, that's where you get this huge fear-mongering campaign from the likes of people like Mike Pompeo, who, who say that Hezbollah is a threat in South America. Of course, everything is to shadow box <laughs> Iran. Everyone uses Hezbollah as like this, this um, you know, it's really just this veil where Iran is really puppeting everything that Hezbollah does. And so whether they're in South America or coming through the border of Mexico, like Douglas McGregor said recently to Tucker Carlson, with Tucker Carlson like, oh, really? Wow. Um, or, of course, Mossad is out there warning that Hezbollah is going to launch terrorist attacks all across Europe. It, it, it's just bizarre. It's like this ubiquitous, you know, like all-encompassing terror group that exists worldwide. Um, talk about what Hezbollah really is, because similarly to Hamas, it is a political party with a military wing. It has representation in the government. It's not a terrorist mm-hmm. organization. Um, this is a completely arbitrary and meaningless term, especially when you see countries like the U.S. and Israel committing genocide with this high-tech weaponry. What what exactly constitutes terrorism and a terrorist organization? So just explain that. Like, What is Hezbollah as an organization, and what do you make of the claim that they are just puppets of Iran? They are a Lebanese organization. Like To suggest... They are Iranian, uh, is just purely sectarianism, and also uh, a kind of way to like dismiss them as what they are, which is an indigenous Lebanese resistance movement. Uh, They are the people, they are like, they come from the peasants of the South who were exposed to Israeli atrocities and Israeli occupation. It's as simple as that. Like, it's not that difficult to understand. (laughs) Um, And they rallied around a religious identity for a reason. It made the most sense to do that in that context in that time period. And they've evolved a lot since. Um, I, you know, when we use the word terrorism, I mean, when I think of that label, God, it's the most politicized label to apply it to Hezbollah, especially for the Americans to apply it to Hezbollah. I mean, the Americans always whine that in the 80s, I think it was like 1983 or something, um, what was the precursor to Hezbollah at the time is believed to have carried out this attack on U.S. Marines. There was also French troops Um, But they killed like over 100 U.S. Marines who came to Lebanon to help fascists during the Civil War. I just want to point that out. They're always like, whenever they commemorate this time every single year at the U.S. Embassy here, they're always like, we came in peace. It's like, no, you didn't. (laughs) And like Ronald Reagan sent you here to help the fascists on the ground. Like, are you to kill Palestinians and kill leftists? So they were bombed um, and a lot of them died. Uh, And the U.S. refers to that as terrorism, which is like, okay, so you're a military from the other side of the world. You sent your Marines to come intervene on the side of fascists in a civil war in Lebanon, and you were attacked by a militia. That doesn't sound like terrorism to me. Don't terrorists target civilians? You were a military. You were actually a legitimate target. I mean, it's just, it's so backwards. It's like the way they call 
called Iraqis terrorists for shooting at U.S. military when they invaded their country. It's like the least terrorist thing you can do is to shoot at a foreign force occupying your country, a foreign military force, when they invade. Anyway, that's, that's one thing that the U.S. always points to to call Hezbollah terrorists, but I hope that that debunks that label in that context. Uh, regardless, the reason they continue to be labeled terrorists by the State Department is because they are a resistance force against Israel, and Israel is an American client state in the region, and anything that resists that is considered terrorism. Even if Hezbollah is targeting like Israeli military, doesn't matter, that's called terrorism. Um, so it's such a useless label here. It is an indi- I want to like repeat this over and over again. Hezbollah is an indigenous Lebanese resistance group. There's all these people who will constantly try to claim that Hezbollah is like some sort of alien force um, that was like, you know, imposed on Lebanon by Iran. And part of that is like a sectarian attitude because there is a U.S., you know, Gulf state backed propaganda campaign, propaganda campaign against Hezbollah in the region for the last, you know, 15 years to try to portray Hezbollah as these like Shia aliens that, you know, are just proxies of Iran. Um, When actually, like, again, they are Lebanese. Their entire existence is about liberating Lebanese land, about protecting the territorial integrity of Lebanon. Um, Their families are Lebanese. This is a Lebanese group and anyone who suggests otherwise is actually engaging in a kind of racism. Um, The other thing though, about the whole idea of Iranian proxy, Iran and Hezbollah are partners. They are partners in what's called the resistance axis. The resistance axis includes Iran, the uh, a few militias in Iraq uh, that are part of the PMF, the Hashish Shabi. Uh, the Syrian government is a part of the resistance axis. Hezbollah, of course. Hamas is a part of the resistance axis, which is, by the way, a Sunni movement. Uh, everybody tries to say, like, everybody's just Shia proxies. They'll even use this disgusting language of, like, what do they call it? A Shia crescent all the way from Tehran to Beirut. That's the kind of language that you've heard for years from the people on K Street. Um, It's just sectarian jargon. Uh, The point is is that they're partners with similar aims, Um, just like the U.S. and Israel are partners. But Hezbollah makes decisions about what's best for Lebanon and what's best for Hezbollah, and also, of course, the resistance axis themselves. Do they probably coordinate with Iran on things that, you know, affect Iran? Um, Yes, certainly. They, just like they do with Hamas, just like they do with the Syrians. But they're not controlled by these actors. All of these different groups that are called proxies of Iran are first and foremost dealing within the context of their own countries, and they have the free reign to make decisions based on what's best with their, for their own countries. But they are part of a broader axis, just like the U.S. and Israel and You know, the UAE and the Saudis, you know, although lately they're a bit like, you know, soft, but the Saudis uh, and the various groups and countries that make up the imperialist axis, if you will, are partners. Although in that context, the U.S. does actually tell people exactly what to do and not to do. (laughs) Except in the case of Israel. Again. Except in the case of Israel where it seems to have no control. Right. All projection. I mean, well, how much support (laughs) does Hezbollah have? Uh, I know it probably increased a lot after they were so successful against Israel in 2006, but has the support strengthened? Has it waned? Like, what is the general sentiment within Lebanese society? And also, like, how much power do they have um, in the government? As far as Hezbollah's power in the country, uh, they have about 13 seats in parliament. Parliament has, like, 128 seats, seats, which doesn't seem like much. For a party, it actually is. There's a lot of political parties in Lebanon. But the more important thing to take into account is that Hezbollah's a part of the largest uh, block in parliament, uh, which gives them quite a bit of power uh, and has for, for years and years and years. They're always, their block is always winning because a majority of the country might not necessarily love Hezbollah specifically or like, um, or anything like that, but they support resistance and they support the resistance having weapons because the Lebanese army, Abby, is largely backed by the U.S., uh, receives a lot of funding from Gulf states. Like it basically just receives handouts from countries that are actually working against Lebanese sovereignty. Uh, and it's a very, the Lebanese army is very weak. They've never actually fought Israel. Um, and that's why, that's why they're intentionally made to be weak. That's so that's wild. that they can never fight Israel. So if, so if Lebanon actually had an army, like a sovereign army, it wouldn't need Hezbollah. But because of foreign powers intervening and violating Lebanese sovereignty, it's not able to have the luxury of having a proper army 
that can defend the country, which is why during the war in Syria, when ISIS and al-Qaeda became a serious threat, not just to Syria, but also to Lebanon, it was Hezbollah that mostly protected all of these Christian villages that were at risk of being slaughtered by ISIS and al-Qaeda groups that were entering the country. Oh, my God. I mean, it, it, it's such a crazy dynamic going on there right now. Um, and that is such an insane point, is how Hamas and Hezbollah reacted to the actual threat of ISIS and just how Netanyahu and his ilk are just depending on just the sheer ignorance of people in the West to just conflate basically all of these groups together with ISIS. Oh, no, I'm sorry. They're worse than ISIS, Rania. You've covered yeah. ISIS extensively. Yeah. You, you know, you're Druze, you um, are Lebanese. And so I, I just quickly address that insanity um, that they tried to peddle at the beginning. I mean, it quickly fell apart because all the so-called atrocities didn't happen. Um, but yeah, just talk about that really quickly. How? What is your opinion on, on the whole talking point that Hamas is worse than ISIS? Yeah, I did cover ISIS. I, I uh, did a series on the Yazidi genocide uh, in northern Iraq. ISIS took uh, Yazidis as sex slaves. It was one of the most horrifying things I've ever covered as a journalist, um, ever. I mean, just the stories I was told. I mean, it was this like medieval fascistic religious apocalyptic force. And what was Heises's ideology? It was like instituting this like medieval form of like Salafi jihadi Wahhabi Islam um, and turning the region basically into like the image of the worst aspects of Saudi Arabia. That's what is, ISIS was trying to do. They weren't a liberation movement. Hamas comes out of a liberation movement. Hamas is Palestinians trying to liberate themselves from a 75-year-long genocidal occupation by a settler colony. There is no equating the two just for the reason of why they're fighting. ISIS came to take out indigenous governments and replace them with something that is not indigenous to the region. Again, much more in common with Israel. If we want to talk about tactics, ISIS was beheading people and taking people as sex slaves. These are not things that Hamas is known to do, despite whatever the Israelis said happened on October 7th, all of which has like fallen apart, all of the worst atrocities they've claimed. Hamas doesn't do that. So it's just not, it's the dumbest thing ever. Their only reason they said that, they were trying to make that equation, is because in the minds of people, it's very easy to just say, oh, you see those brown people who are yep. Muslims? They're ISIS, hate them. Because the American and Western publics, because of decades of dehumanization and propaganda and hatred and inculcated in people against Arabs and Muslims to justify an endless war on terror, are primed to assume the worst and to hate people if they're Arab and Muslim. And so that's the only reason that was said. And one more thing, Abby, I'll add, is if we're going to talk about ISIS and Al-Qaeda groups, um, because I include Al-Qaeda as an extension of that, which they were, Al-Qaeda in Syria, who was helping Al-Qaeda in Syria? Mm -hmm. We know that in the Golan, it was Israel. We know that. We know that. It was, it's been revealed over and over again. I, I actually reported on that. I went to the Syrian Golan and talked to people who were formerly a part of the Syrian opposition, the so-called Free Syrian Army in that area. And they, they actually withdrew their participation from those rebel groups because of the coordination with Syria or with, um, with the Israelis in the Golan. They were receiving armaments and aid from the Israelis in the Golan. So if you want to talk about who has the most in common with ISIS, it's actually the Israelis, not Hamas. I want to go back to Nasrallah really quickly, though, because I think that when everything erupted in Gaza, I think a lot of people were expecting Hezbollah to do more. Um, it seems like they have been pretty restrained, even though there has been an all-out war on the border. Um, they could do more. Um, Nasrallah, you mentioned, gave one speech before. This is his second speech that just happened yesterday at the time of this recording. It's um, Sunday, November 12th. Why do you think that that was? Why do you think he kind of sat back for a while and talk about what speech he finally did give yesterday? What was the significance of it? What was said? His main points were about, like that he raised yesterday, his main points last week were to reintroduce the rules of engagement, to warn the Israelis. It was also specifically to tell the Americans and Europeans, we need a ceasefire. You don't want regional war. We don't want regional war either. You are the ones with the power to stop Israel. And to note that Israel created objectives for itself that it can't meet. The objective being 
to eradicate Hamas. Um, that's not a goal that Israel can ever meet because you can't eradicate Hamas. Even if Israel turns all of Gaza into ash, Hamas will still exist. If not, it might even exist more because the whole reason Hamas exists is a res as armed resistance to Israel's atrocities. I mean, who do you think Hamas is? Hamas is like the children of 2008, the, the, all those orphaned kids that Israel killed in 2008. But he made the point that Israel's always committed atrocities against civilians. They've done it since their founding. That is what they do. They kill women and children. They bomb women and children. They commit atrocity after atrocity after atrocity. And that hasn't made anybody submit. It's just made resistance groups feel more passionately about their reason for existing. So he made that point as well and like talked about steadfastness and patience because ultimately Nisrallah does not want a war with Israel. He, he clearly, like he made this point in his first speech and reiterated, this is a war that's like, this is a Palestinian war. This is a war in Gaza. Um, and the, like the, there's red lines. He doesn't say this in his speech. He says it in code, but the red lines for Hezbollah to drag Lebanon and I don't want to say drag Lebanon, that's just how people here say it sometimes, but, but for Hezbollah to take all of Lebanon into a full-on war with Israel, there are really like two red lines that need to be met. One of the red lines is Israel needs to start, like it would be like if Israel escalated to where it was bombing South Beirut. But the more important one I think to, to pay attention to, because I don't think Israel's going to do that for reasons that would mean that Israel would have Tel Aviv being bombed in very horrifying ways for them, is the idea of Hamas's ability to sustain a fight in Gaza. If Hamas really does get to a point where it is like threatened with serious like eradication as a resistance force, then Hezbollah would have to get more involved. So it's a waiting game, which is why he's talking about patience and steadfastness. We need to be patient because these atrocities are meant as psychological warfare. They're meant to make us all just feel destroyed uh, and to just submit. Uh, and we can't do that, right? We can't do that. What's happening in Gaza is horrifying, but the Israelis basically can't be victorious because they can't take out Hamas. And so it comes down to there's only one person really that can stop this war. There's only one force that can put a, top, a stop to this genocide. And that force isn't Hezbollah. It's not Iran. It's actually not even Hamas because Israel's just gonna keep going. It's the Americans. And he noted that, he noted that, like he actually kind of gave a shout out to the protests in the West. He specifically said yesterday in his speech that the most important thing happened, one of the most important things happening right now is the massive mobilizations and protests taking place in Western cities, because that's what's gonna put pressure on these Western countries to stop this genocide. But, uh, and also like, you know, he reinforced the rules of engagement with Israel, which he did last time. Um, which I've talked about a lot of that already, uh, which is the tit for tat. You kill our civilians, we'll kill your civilians. But I will say this, this war at the south of Lebanon has been going on now for 37 days. It's escalated to the point where now the Israelis are hitting 40 kilometers into Lebanon. The rules of engagement are breaking down. Hezbollah is running out of targets to hit in Northern Israel. Um, They've already like taken out a lot of the surveillance equipment, a lot of tanks, a lot of, you know, various military bases. They're running out of things to target that are in a zone where it can stay contained, right? At some point they'll have to branch out and it'll have to escalate from their end. And you can only go up the escalation ladder notch by notch for so long before it reaches that tipping point and triggers a bigger war. So if the rules of engagement are breaking down, the real question becomes how much longer will the genocide in Gaza continue. Because the more things escalate against Gaza and against Hamas, the more likely things will escalate from Lebanon, the more likely we get to that trigger point of war between Lebanon and Israel, and the more likely we get to a trigger point of all out regional war, which absolutely nobody, including the Americans want. So really it's just how much longer are the Americans going to allow the Israelis to slaughter children in Gaza? That's the big question. Exactly. And the fact that Biden just said a couple of days ago that a, a ceasefire is not a possibility. It's not on the table. 
Um, but like you said, I mean, this is going to be a regional war if this continues because it's not just Lebanon, it's, you know, Iraq. You mentioned Iraq earlier, Yemen. Um, militias in both countries are doing attacks against U.S. military installations. In Iraq last week, um, a huge army barracks almost blew up and killed tons of soldiers, but the drone didn't detonate. And this is, was from one of the Iraqi militias there. That's insane. I mean, just imagine if that actually was a successful operation, what we would be talking about right now in terms of regional warfare and retaliation against Iraq. Um, so there is a lot happening, Rania. This could spiral out very quickly and it's super scary to think about. You mentioned earlier all of these fanatical Israeli officials and you know commanders who are not only on the beach in Gaza saying we're back in our ancestral lands, but saying openly and gleefully we are going to take Lebanon, which seems weird. It seems like very crazy to just be so happy. Like this guy was like, could have been crying out of happiness because of him like saying, we're going to do the Greater Israel Project. It's like, didn't you just have like a huge national tragedy? Like, why are you so thrilled? Um, and it just really exposes themselves, right? This is all just whitewashing the real intent of what's going on here, which is taking all of the land that they think they're entitled to. But but then you have U.S. politicians and media pundits tone policing pro-Palestine mm -hmm. pro demonstrators talking about from the river to the sea. No, that's the real genocidal intent, Rania. How dare you use that it's phrase? Crazy. Um, meanwhile, there's actual genocide going on. They're actually talking about taking Lebanon. This stuff is actually horrifying because Israel's a nuclear armed state. It's backed by the U.S. empire. What's happening in Gaza, even though it's horrifying and unprecedented, it's nothing compared to what they want to do and what they feel like they're entitled to do. And why would well, we think for a second that Israel's not insane enough to do it? Because the U.S. already said there's no red lines. You know, it's funny, every time um, some crazy Israeli official, which by the way, the Israeli defense minister, Yoav Gallant, if I had to like imagine what a Nazi looked and sounded like in like the 1940s, <laughs> if you look, look at an image of that guy, like he kind of is a spitting image of what an SS officer shouting about like crazy supremacy would sound like. And he sounds like it when he talks too. He just got this very shouty face. <laughs> um, but whenever Israeli officials like make these wild, just like belligerent comments about what they want to do to their neighbors, um, I have one friend who always reminds me that the dog with the loudest bark is the one that is most afraid. Um, so you have Gallant like running up to the you know north and giving this like speech about you know turning Beirut into Gaza right after Nasrallah's speech, just sounds to me like a scared bully. Because they haven't done it. I mean, again, they still mm -hmm. could. They have the superior air power to completely flatten Lebanon. But there's a reason they haven't done it. Because they, they're scared about the damage that will happen to them. And maybe they might get to a point where they make the calculation that that damage is acceptable because flattening Lebanon is more worth it than to protecting their own people. And we've seen them. We've seen them make decisions that harm their own people. I mean, look at their freaking hostages. So I don't want to put it past them. But I do want to say something about what Nisrella said that's related to the sort of expansion of regional war that you mentioned um, before I address the uh, insanity among U.S. politicians, particularly the Republican ones, even though they're all insane, uh, is he actually went through in his speech yesterday each front and its importance. He started with Gaza. Obviously, the primary front in this war right now is Gaza and Hamas fighting the Israelis there. The second front he mentioned was West Bank. And he noted the resistance factions in the West Bank that are shooting at the Israeli occupiers in various places, uh, like Janine, for example. Um, the next front he mentioned was Yemen. Uh, and he praised the Yemenis for, you know, sending these uh, drone attacks to this uh, port, I guess this like Israeli port in Ailet at the Red Sea. Uh, that they've managed to intercept a few times, including one interception by a Gulf state government, because that's who said they're actually one. Um, he then mentioned the Syria front, and he noted that Syria often has to carry the burden of being punished for these other fronts operations. So like after the Yemeni drone strike uh, in Ailet, you saw uh, Israeli airstrikes on Syria in response. He then mentioned Iran, 
And he specifically, he specifically referenced Iran's not only like moral and rhetorical and diplomatic support, but Iran's material support for the resistance, which is the most important part of Iran's uh, participation in this axis, is the material support. And then, then he talked about the Lebanon front uh, and reiterated again, you know, the, the Lebanon front is there to alleviate pressure from the Gaza front, as I explained earlier. Uh, and the reason I note all of that is he was saying that to explain how much more things can escalate in the region, especially with the involvement of the Americans, which have sent two aircraft carriers to the Mediterranean, and as well as a submarine, which they announced, which, capable, which is capable of, of firing a nuclear weapon, a submarine, like capable of, of holding a nuclear weapon, has been dispatched to the Mediterranean, and they announced it. They announced it, which they don't often do, and that's all meant to be a deterrence to Hezbollah getting more involved in this war. Um, but is that going to deter them? I mean, the Americans are so stupid. They just think showing off their weapons is going to deter these groups. It certainly makes them think more about whether they really want a regional war. They don't. They've said it repeatedly. That is why they are calling for a ceasefire. I mean, fire. I mean, Abby, isn't it amazing that all of these terrorist forces are calling for an end to the fighting? Right. And it's like the Americans and the Israelis who are like, no, no, we want to keep slaughtering. We want to keep slaughtering and they're terrorists and we're civilized. I also think about, and this is not to promote lesser evilism. I hate lesser evilism and I don't agree with it. And fuck the Democratic Party and fuck Joe Biden um, for supporting genocide, for arming genocide, for being an absolute racist monster. Uh, that said, I do think about the fact that like, what if Trump and Mike Pompeo were in charge right now? Because like the one thing you do have with the Biden administration is a hesitancy to have a regional war, Right. Um, if Mike Pompeo was calling the shots, I think we'd have a regional war right now. And the reason I bring that up is not to tell people to vote Democrat. Fuck Democrats. Don't ever vote for them again. However, we are in a situation where if you watch that Republican debate and you saw what they were saying, where they were like talking about if, if I was in charge, Gaza wouldn't exist under Biden, it still exists. That was literally what people were saying. It was insane. I mean, Trump is out there saying that, um, Trump is out there saying that Biden is taking his cues from pro-Palestine like legislators. It's like, what on? I wish he was. Holy hell, are you talking about, dude? <laughs> like they just censored. I mean, Trump's also <laughs> Rashida Tlaib. Like, what? What on earth are you talking? I mean, it's a fantasy land that they're living in, considering that Biden is doing everything that Netanyahu wants him to do. And in the process, he's destroying his prospects for another presidency. Of course. And I really think we're looking at a really dangerous situation where, like. I don't use this lightly because I hate people throwing around the word fascist, but I'm not sure what you call people who call for putting people in camps. And like Trump right. is explicitly once again talking about the left and how that's the big enemy. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. It just it just seems like a nightmare all around. Right. I don't like, really what know would, what much what more to add to that. What would be happening to the pro-Palestine demonstrations with Trump in yeah. office? And I mean, he's openly saying he would like deport all Hamas sympathizers. That means us, according to him, because we're just out there protesting for Palestinian rights. So it is a very dangerous climate, Rania. It's already dangerous for Arabs, for Muslims in this country. I feel like it's 9-12-2001. The Biden administration is monstrous for continuing to green light these atrocities. It's just such an interesting moment in time because it's like, what else needs to happen for Arab Gulf countries to stand up and sever ties? I mean, what will it take? Because you just had this summit Last week, where Arab leaders, Iran's president, um, you know, of course, they all condemn Israeli terrorism against Palestinians. That's the easy thing. But unfortunately, the majority of countries there vetoed a resolution that would have not only severed diplomatic and economic ties with Israel, but would have created an oil embargo, which is what's needed. I mean, if you really want to catalyze the Western <laughs> world, we know what talks. Cut off the oil, baby. They all mm -hmm. vetoed it. I mean, when I talk about they all, Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain, Sudan, Morocco, Mauritania, and Djibouti. So, I mean, I guess I'm not too surprised considering that a lot of them are essentially client states of the West, but it still is just crazy that they could have done this. They could have really done something. Yeah, and the reason they don't is because, again, you just said they're client states. It's the whole point of having client states. It's the whole point of having normalization. 
uh, so that when it comes to situations like this, you don't have a united front uh, against the most disgusting excesses of imperialism. And Macron just, of course, said that he wants a ceasefire as well, which was a huge victory. And, and it's a testament to the power of protests and mass mobilizations, the tens of millions of people taking to the streets around the world, demanding justice and peace for our brothers and sisters in Palestine. Rania, your show, Dispatches, is one of the best shows out there, um, if, any, if not the best geopolitical analysis going on um, through an anti-imperialist lens. Where can people find your work? And um, yeah, thank you so much for coming on Empire Files and talking about all this. Well, no, thank you. And it really is such a privilege and an honor to get to join you. And I take my cues from you, Abby. You're like an inspiration to me. Uh, um, my show, Dispatches, you can find it on Breakthrough News. I, if, you know, if you haven't already, please do go subscribe to Breakthrough News on all platforms, including YouTube and Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, if you're a TikToker, we've got TikTok stuff on the Breakthrough News TikTok. Um, and you can follow me at Rania Kalik uh, on Twitter, uh, where I just shout into the ether like the rest of <laughs> you all, because that's all we can do in this moment. <laughs>